Well, when is torture justified? That is a question that we think about in the military all the time. And 50% of Americans, believe it or not, according to a recent CBS poll, believe that torture is justified by the United States if we hold a detainee and we think it is necessary. So let's explore that issue today. Let's talk about why that is. And to do that, let's go on a journey together, a journey that I took uh, over the last 12 years and a journey that I want you to go on today. And it's a journey that requires both physical and mental courage. Now, you see a slide up on there, and it's, it's from 2003. And I put it up on the screen so you'd have a chance to look at it. And you'll see rule three is on the slide. When we give briefings to our soldiers, we give them a briefing about the law of war before they deploy. And this is the exact slide that I gave in 2003 in Mannheim, Germany to a group of soldiers sitting much like you, except they had to be there. They didn't pay to be there. And they were there because they had to learn the rules of war and how we treat detainees, our targeting decisions, many issues. And you'll see from this slide, point number three, the basic rule that we have, and that is to treat people that we in the military capture as you would want to be treated. Or, if you don't like to be treated well, as your buddy would like to be treated, okay? And we make that point because soldiers many times care more about their battle buddy than they care about themselves. And then the fourth one is kind of a duh issue for us as judge advocates, as lawyers. Torture is illegal. Now remember, this is 2003. The invasion of Iraq is about to start, and these soldiers are leaving to go to combat. And it included mock, sec mock executions and water cure. Now, water cure is what we now refer to as waterboarding, but that's what we had on the slide, and I wanted you to know exactly what we talked about. And we talked about leaving interrogations to the professionals, to the people who can know exactly how to follow the rules of the Army and get reliable information, because we believe that tortured information is inherently unreliable. I didn't think much about that slide until 2004, and that's when we all heard about what happened at Abu Ghraib. And as a military officer, I was shocked, and I was saddened about what had happened. And I was wondering, why did these soldiers do this? After we've had the training, it just seemed very strange to me and my colleagues. I was a professor at the JAG School in Charlottesville, and we were having these philosophical discussions. And our leaders told us it was a few bad apples. But the truth was, it was an apple tree. And they were part of an apple tree that had been planted at the highest levels of our government. And that apple tree spread from other government organizations, like the Central Intelligence Agency, that enabled contractors to use enhanced interrogation techniques on detainees that we had captured. What is torture? Torture is the severe infliction of emotional or physical pain or suffering. And it's done in order to get compliance from an individual, whether it's to get a confession, admission, information. And President Obama, recently in a press conference, said somewhat inartfully, we tortured some folks. And he meant we did a lot of things right after 9-11, but one of the things we did wrong is torture detainees. We waterboarded. We did mock executions and other things that qualify as torture. And the reason President Obama said it and the result of that has made this somewhat of a political debate. And it's very strange to me as a military officer as a, as a military officer, I'm not a politician. I have the advantage of looking my enemy in the eye. So we do that. And in the politicians, they've made this a partisan political issue. But why do 50% of people believe in this country that torture is justified in some circumstances? Well, it goes on to say 60% of people believe it works. 
And if you believe 60% of the American public believes something works that might save lives, why not do it? Well, the reason that 60% of Americans believe that torture works is because of TV and movies, in my opinion. It's the only place it does work. And it works because of shows like 24 and Homeland, Jack Bauer saving the day at the last minute 75 times in five seasons. Um, <laughs> And it's important to note, that's fiction. It's not real. But we have turned what the media has made from a dramatic device to move the plot along so that things can work into the truth, what we sometimes believe as human beings. And so when we talk about what happened and why did we torture people, we go to the next area I want to talk about on this journey, and that is to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. That's where I became involved in military commissions in 2008 as a defense lawyer, like Jeff talked about. And it was in 2008 that I started representing the detainees there, and I wondered, why do we have Guantanamo Bay? We've got a functioning court system that does a good job convicting people. We've got a military court-martial system and the only conclusion I could draw is we have Guantanamo Bay and the military commission system because in those systems we could not convict someone because much of the evidence that we derived was derived from torture. And that evidence would not be admissible in another courtroom. There are no U.S. citizens detained at Guantanamo Bay. The only people who are at Guantanamo Bay in detention are those who detained on the war on terror, and they're non-citizens. So we've set up a system of justice that is second class for those people who are not citizens. Well, you may think that's OK. But next time you're in DC, you can always stop by if you want to say hello. But go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of the United States, as you walk in, has four words, equal justice under law and there is no asterisk. And it means what it says. Every person who is prosecuted in our systems should be treated equally. The next stop on our journey is to the courtroom at Guantanamo Bay. That's a former aircraft control tower that was converted to a courtroom. And that's where I met and represented Omar Khadr. Omar was a 15-year-old kid who was captured on the battlefields of Afghanistan. I'm not going to talk to you about Omar specifically, but my representation of Omar and what happened. And the flip side of the torture coin that we always talk about, but we never hear about. And that is, I went to interview a soldier who had served as an interrogator at Bagram. And he had interrogated Omar Khadr but he had agreed to meet with me and my paralegal. So we went to his home. It wasn't his home, it was his parents' home. And we went inside and we started to talk and he was visibly shaking. He was very anxious, I could tell. We sat down at the table and I looked over to the right and I noticed a lot of pill bottles, prescription pill bottles. And he saw me and unprompted said, I take medication for PTSD, for anxiety, for depression. And I said, well, things happen at Bagram. And he said, well, no, it's not because of what happened to me after 9-11 or what happened at Bagram Air Base. It's because of what I did. I tortured Omar Khadr and I tortured other people. So when you hear people talk about when is torture justified, think about the person who has to do the torturing because they're a victim too. When we ask our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to go into unchartered waters and torture people and get information from them by waterboarding them or other means, then they become victims in this process. They could be your brother, they could be your sister. Majid Khan. Majid Khan's lunch tray consisting of hummus, pasta with sauce, nuts, and raisins was pureed and rectally infused. 
Now, the reason that slide is up there and it has Helen Mirren, you're probably wondering why she would be up there, is because John Oliver did a special about torture in one of his segments. And he's so upset that no one will look at this torture report that the Senate put out, he had Helen Mirren read parts of it, okay? Because it's an important thing for the U.S. to know about. Majid is my client, and he did bad things. And he has pled guilty to those bad things. But all of the information that was needed to prosecute him and to get intelligence for the war on terror was gained prior to him being tortured. Because the evidence shows over and over again that those people who are in CIA custody and who were tortured gave false information. And let me give you an idea about that. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, after he was waterboarded many, many times, talked about an, a plot in Montana where he was sending someone to recruit African-American Muslims to attack the United States. And the FBI, I hear laughter, uh, Montana, and the FBI spent thousands of hours of resources chasing down this lead, and it was completely false. And he said, I said it so they'd stop torturing me. Now, the next stop on our journey is back D.C. where I am, and it's the World War II Memorial. And I want to talk to you about people who've actually served in combat. I'm a lawyer. I've been in combat zones, but I'm not, although I'm a combatant under the Geneva Conventions and people can shoot at me, um, I've never been in that role. But the people who have are the veterans like in World War II. And I was at the World War II Memorial, and a gentleman came up to me, and he was in his 80s, and he had a veteran's cap on, and he came up and he shook my hand, and he said, I understand that you represent the detainees at Guantanamo Bay, and I want to thank you for doing that. And I said, well, thank you very much. Uh, tell me about you. And he said, well, I want to tell you why I'm thanking you. I said, okay, tell me. He said, because I was on Iwo Jima as a Marine. And when I was on Iwo Jima as a Marine, it was savage fighting. And about 10 days before the battle ended, a young Japanese soldier wearing nothing but like a loincloth and boots, and he had a pamphlet in his hand that we had sent up in artillery shells to tell people if they surrender, we will treat you humanely and we'll feed you. And this young soldier comes forward and he surrenders. And what the moral of that story is, there was a sniper shot as a lieutenant went out to get him, and that sniper shot went through the helmet of this person, this lieutenant, rattled around in his helmet, did not harm him, and went down the back of his jacket. Miraculously, he survived. And he would have been well within his right to think he was set up, right? I've been set up by the Japanese. But he followed his training. And when he followed his training, they learned that this young soldier who had surrendered was the chief code clerk on Iwo Jima for the commander. And that chief code clerk gave all the remaining positions for the Japanese army on Iwo Jima, and then helped on the invasion of Okinawa the next month. So when you think about torture, we don't know what would have happened. Well, we know what would have happened if he killed him, but torturing that Japanese soldier was never even a thought in the Americans' minds, because that's not how we operate. I took this photograph at Guantanamo Bay the day after President Obama was inaugurated the first time. And as a son of Memphis, a graduate of Kirby High School, and a graduate of the Memphis Law School, I ask you, is that a sunrise or a sunset over Guantanamo Bay? Thank you very much.